Uh, welcome. I want to thank everyone for joining me tonight. Uh, Kathy told me I was in a rut, that uh, I did the same thing every week. I always started the same way and I always end the same way and I always said exactly the same thing. And and uh, But you know, I'm a creature of habit. I can't help myself. And uh, I just like the way I do things, I guess. I don't know. But, but anyway, uh, I, I'm a creature of habit. I, I like doing things the way I've always done it. That reminds me, I'm going to tell you a story. And I know I've told this story before, but I like it. And I will tell it again, and just uh, so you'll have to listen anyway. But here it is: uh, there was a newly married couple that uh, uh, that you know they were young, just starting out, and she was anxious to cook her husband a, a really great supper uh, uh, dinner. So she had bought a big, nice roast, and and she was preparing the roast, and she seasoned it, and she uh, got everything ready, and then she cut off both ends, and she put it in a pan, and then she put the two slices of the two ends on either side of it and then she put it in the oven to, co uh, to cook it and her husband asked her he says how come you did that how come you cut it cut the sides off and put it and she goes um i i don't really know that's the way my uh, i was taught that's the way my mother always did it so so that's the way i've always done it says it always comes out really tender and perfect so so i'm sure there's a reason but i don't know what what it would be and and it says, you'll have to ask my mom why, why we do that. So a few weeks later, they were uh, at her, her mother's house. And he asked his mother-in-law, says, I want to ask you a question. It says, the other night, my wife fixed us a big old uh, pot roast. And, and she cooked it. And anyway, she, she got it all ready and she put it in a pan. She cut the ends off of it and put them on the sides. And she said, that's the way that you taught her to cook it. And I want to know why. And he, she says, she said, yeah, I says, that's the way I cook it. And says, I've always cooked it that way. She said, actually, that's the way my mother taught me. And I don't really know why we do that. You'll have to, you'll have to ask her grandmother why she does that. So the opportunity finally came that they were around the grandmother. And, and uh, the, the young husband asked the grandmother, she says, uh, when you cook roast, do you cut the ends off and put them on the side of the roast when you, when you cook it? And she goes, yeah. And she go, he goes, well, uh, I want to know how come. She said, well, it's because I've got a round roasting pot, and it's the only way it'll fit. You know, they were, they were doing it that way because uh, their mother did it that way, and their grandmother did it that way, but they never knew why they were doing it that way. But, but uh, I can't help myself. I always do things the same way, and I, uh, I like doing things the same way, and I'm comfortable with that. But anyway... Uh, tonight we're studying in the book of Ephesians. Uh, this is our Bible study. And, and tonight we're looking at Ephesians 3, 8 through 13. And it says this, To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, and I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make uh, all see what is the fellowship of the, of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God who created all things, all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers and heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this time that I have to share your word, and, and I pray that, that you just bless this tonight. I know it's your, uh, uh, your word that has the power and the strength, and I pray that you anoint it as it touches our hearts and our lives, and I pray that you just use it uh, for your honor and glory. And I pray also that everything that I say and everything I do uh, brings glory unto you, and I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. It, uh, <clears throat> right now, tonight, as we're starting off, Paul makes the, the statement, who am less than the least of all saints. Uh, Paul's not saying here he's the least of the apostles, so he does later on in the, in the scriptures, and I'll, we'll look at that in a minute, but he, but he says, I am the least of all believers. I'm, if ever, if ever there was anyone that did, does not deserve to be a child of God, it's me. That's what he's saying. Now, Paul was loved and respected in the Christian world, and, but Paul knew Paul. He, he knew what he was capable of. He knew what he was like, and, and, and he knew his heart, and, 
And he knew how he was. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says this, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul said, At one time I was the enemy of the church, and I persecuted the church. I, uh, I was against them. And, and uh, if you remember in a Damascus story, we looked at that uh, last week and, and parts of it, but there's another part that I won't mention tonight. And it's in Acts 9, 8 and 9. It says this, Then Saul arose from the ground, uh, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was, th uh, he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. For three days, Paul sat in a room, blind. He sat there and he didn't eat and he didn't drink anything. And I, I'm betting he didn't sleep much either. He just sat there thinking. And, and I think that's what he was doing there in this time. If you remember, Paul was a, was a Bible scholar. Uh, he knew the Old Testament. He knew all the prophecies and everything that was written. Uh, and when he saw Jesus in, in all of his glory on the road to Damascus, he realized that Jesus was not only the promised Messiah, but Jesus was God. And, and I'm sure that, that, that Paul spent this time filling in the blanks, uh, looking at scriptures and looking at Jesus and his life. And, and he was remembering all that, that Jesus had said and done. Uh, there's no mention of, of Paul uh, in the Gospels. Uh, I don't know if he was, uh, had not made it to the stature of, of a Pharisee then or if he was still in training, but, uh, but I do know that, that he sat at the feet of Gamal even, and he would have heard everything. Uh, Gamal was, was the, uh, the leader of the Sanhedrin, so everything would be discussed by them. And so he would hear all the stories if he didn't see them himself firsthand. And, and he even heard about the, the meal at Simon, the Pharisee's house, because that was the, the son of Gamal. And, and uh, that later took Gamal's place as, as head of the Sanhedrin. But, but anyway, he, he heard all the stories. He knew all that Jesus had said and done. And he also knew all the prophecies. And, and he spent time realizing that, that this was God, that, that he was an enemy of God. That was probably a pretty uh, sobering thought to him. And I, I wonder if he, uh, even as he wrote this, if he could picture the faces of those that he had all, that he had persecuted. He was in Rome and this is the very end of his life. And, and I wonder if he could still see Stephen's face when Stephen was praying to God when, when he was there. I wonder if he can I bet he could still remember every word that Stephen spoke then. And, and, uh, but anyway, Paul knew who he was and he knew what he did. And he considered himself to be the, the least of the apostles, the, uh, the, the, very, the very start of them, the, the bottom rung of the ladder. Uh, uh, every now and then somebody will come up to me and say, well, your own staff here says uh, you need to do this or you need to you need to tell them that. And I always tell them the same thing. I said, you don't understand. I'm I'm not very high up on the ladder. He said, I said, I tell him I'm not even a step. I said, you remember that little swivelly thing on the bottom of the ladder? Well, I'm that rubber thing underneath that. I'm not I don't have much much authority here. But but really, just like Paul, uh, I know who I am and I I know who I, what, what I've done and I know what I'm. Uh, capable of, and I know how I am, and, and you know who you are, and you know how you are, and we we look at this, and we we wonder at times, how can we stand before a holy God? How can we do that? And the answer is grace, and and it tells us here. It says, "To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, His grace was given." It says, "To me, His grace was given, even though that I was the worst, in spite of who I am, in spite of who I was, in, in spite of what I done." God extended his grace toward me and it was given to me. Isn't that great? I mean, that's, that means there's hope for us. That means that, that, that there's joy in our life because of, you know, if, if Paul was accepted, you know, that, that we'll be accepted by, by grace and we have that grace in our lives. And that's the glory of grace. God gives grace freely. It doesn't matter what you've done. His grace is sufficient to cover all of our sins. It doesn't matter. When, when he died on the cross, he covered all of our sins. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, he is also known as the Milwaukee um, um, cannibal or the Milwaukee monster. Um, he was a serial killer. And um, he had murdered and dismembered 
uh, 17 different men and boys from 1978 to uh, 1991. And, um, and in his latter murders, well, he would, it involved cannibalism and uh, uh, he would also permanently preserve parts of the bodies, mostly the skeletons and uh, some of them hold and, and some of them just a skull and, and he would keep them. And, uh, and he was just, just a terrible guy. And, and although he was diagnosed with uh, three different types of disorders, they, uh, uh, they tried him as legally sane. And he was convicted of 16 different murders and, uh, that he had committed. And he had 16 life sentences in his life. But get this straight. Jeffrey Dahmer would catch different men and boys. He would imprison them. He would sexually assault them. He would abuse them. He would kill them, even eat parts of them, and boil their burn bones and keep them for a souvenir. And the question is, could the Lord save a man like that? Is, is, uh, or would even want to, as terrible as that was and horrible as that was, could God save him? But it's also recorded that sure, shortly after completing his, all of the trials that he was in, his sentencing in 1991, he requested from Detective Murphy uh, a copy of the Bible. And uh, it, the request was granted to him. And uh, he devoted himself to studying God's Word and he became a born-again believer. And in uh, May 1994, uh, Dahmer was baptized by Roy Ratcliffe, a minister of Church of Christ. And uh, following that, he, he'd given his life to the Lord, and he, uh, he worked and taught in, in classes, and, and he met with this preacher every, every, on a weekly basis, you know, uh, uh, serving the Lord. Uh, God's grace was sufficient for a man like Jeffrey Dahmer. And it, God's grace is sufficient for Paul and it's sufficient for, for me. And, and God's grace is sufficient for you. Um, and this grace was extended, as Paul tells us here. It says that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul was given grace to share. He was, uh, he was given grace to share the gospel among the Gentiles and, and he was sent to uh, minister, actually, to the very group that he hated. You know, they, there ought to be some type of warning there. But anyway, he was sent to the Gentiles who he thought were, were dogs, were just lesser men. And, and you have to realize that God gave Paul a love for these people, a concern for these people. He didn't see them as crude uh, anymore. He saw them as empty vessels, uh, people that needed to know the Lord, people that needed salvation. What we see today are people with, uh, with no love or respect for anyone or anything. Uh, the call for today is, I want everything my way and I want it now. And all we're hearing is demands. Everybody has a demand. Everybody wants something. But, but look, they're, they're open vessels. As believers, we have never had a better opportunity in our country to share the love of God. Um, like Paul said, I get to preach to the Gentiles in searchable riches of Christ. We get to preach. We get to share the gospel with other people. Look at the opportunities around us. Look at the chances that we have to share. And we share the unreachable reaches, uh, unsearchable reaches, uh, riches of Christ. I'll get it right in a minute. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. My, uh, I'll start over and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Uh, to, to help others see the fellowship that we have in, in the church, um, uh, they can't know uh, what a fellowship we have with Christ uh, unless they've experienced it. Uh, they can't know the unity that we have as believers, the fellowship that we have when we meet in this place, unless you are a believer. And they can't share the love unless the love's been shared to them. Unless they're one of us, unless they're a born-again child of God, they don't know that. The fellowship with God, the fellowship with Christ, the fellowship with other believers, how do you describe that to people that don't know the Lord? You know, they don't understand. They don't, they don't know what's about, uh, what it's about because it is hidden from the world. It says, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus. When the fellowship was broken, uh, in the Garden of Eden, God had a plan. Uh, and that was to renew 
the fellowship with man, the fellowship that he had in the garden with man, and, and to restore us back to his masterpiece or, or uh, uh, of his creation. And he did all of that through Jesus Christ, everything. And Paul had the, had the joy and the privilege uh, to make that known to the church. And, and uh, you realize we want to be part of that joy. We want to be... Uh, we want to be excited about God's work. We want to share God's word and, and see people saved and, and the joy of that. I heard a story one time about a, a young preacher that had accepted a call to a, a community church. And I, I used to know his name and the church's name, but I've forgotten and I couldn't find it anywhere. But anyway, but he had a strong desire to see people saved, uh, but it was hard to inspire the church. It was a smaller church and they were comfortable and they were uh, happy the way they were. And it was a matter of prayer to him. And in the evenings while he would pray, he would get a desire just to, to go out and drive around and, and see if he could find people in need. And, and uh, they lived, uh, the, the town was right off interstate like we are here. And, and he carried a couple of gallons of gas and a, a jack and some jumper cables with him as he traveled around. And, and, um, and he would find people stranded and he would help them. Then he would share the, the gospel with them, and people were getting saved. And he shared that with his church, and, uh, but they were unconcerned, and they even thought he was probably crazy for doing that. But uh, anyway, one night, one of the older deacons went with him, and uh, uh, it was a chance to talk to him about how dangerous it was to be out and the strangers in the night and all that. So he, he went with him to encourage him as a young, young pastor. But anyway, they hadn't been driving around long, until he found a whole family that was stranded on the road. They had run out of gas. And he put his two gallons in and, and, and talked with them and questioned them and shared the gospel with them. And he led the whole family to the Lord right there on the side of the road. And, and they were all saved. And, and, and as he was leaving, he hugged their necks and they promised him that they would, when they got back home, they would get involved with the church and they'd find a church home and everything. everything. But anyway, the young preacher headed back to the uh, service station to refill his can to go and look for other people. And, and uh, you may wonder about the old deacon. Uh, the preacher had to circle the, the gas station two or three times, he said, before, before he could pull in there because the preacher was praising God and crying and open before the Lord. And, and the grace of God changed him and began to change that church. And they found the joy and the privilege of sharing the word of God with other people and serving the Lord. And they began to know the Lord. It, it says in, in verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Uh, the very purpose of the church is to know the wisdom of God. And, and that was Paul's intention was to teach. And in, in his letters that he wrote, it was to, to be shared that everyone would know. In, in Proverbs 9 and 10, it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Uh, that's our message. That's, that's what we are called to do. That's the intent of our church. If you, uh, Our motto is to know God and to make Him known. That's the goal of our church, is to share the Word of God and share God with the people around us. And we have seen that power in, in our ministries and in our church. It says, to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, We've seen God work in people's lives. Uh, look at the ministry uh, that we've had in, in, in Kenya and how it is there and all the churches that are started there and, and, and the ministry that we, we had in Mexico. And there are several churches that were started down there in, in San Diego. They're, right now they're even starting churches. It, it, uh, uh, the work is, is, is going on here. And even in the Middle East, look what we've done. And uh, I've heard people say, well, well, because of all this virus and everything that we've come to a halt. No, we haven't. We're still alive and working and we're ministering here. We're ministering there and other places and we're still ministering all around the world. And, and, but you have to realize we have so much that's opening up around us. Uh, we've started the church in the dirt and, and we're ministering at the Boys and Girls Club. And, and, and look at all the opportunities now that we have to minister to families around us. God is, God is working through us and doing things through us. We're the, we are the light in the darkness and, and we need uh, to be involved in our community. Our community needs us right now more than ever. 
And, and God has a purpose in all this. He has a purpose in our life, and He has a purpose. It says, according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is God's purpose in all this? You know, you, you see things going on, and, and, and uh, uh, everybody's questioning God and all this. What's His purpose? Uh, God's purpose is always the same, and it's to... to um, uh, for people to come to the saving knowledge of our Savior, Lord Jesus uh, Christ. That's always been his plan, always has, and, and it always been his purpose. And our purpose is to help people uh, find the Lord. It's not, to, uh, it's not for us to uh, help people adapt to this new way of life or, or what they're going through or get ready for the, the different jobs or, or what's involved in all that and people without jobs. Uh, our responsibility is to, to share the gospel, to prepare people for the next world, not this world. And we have access to that purpose. It says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. We have a boldness and we have access to the power of God. The question is, do we have a voice? Do we, do we care? I, I talked to a, a man the other day and he was telling me that he was stuck at home. He said all he did was just sit around on Facebook. That's all he could do anymore. And, and I asked him if uh, what he was posting on Facebook, and he said, well, not much. He said, I usually just like things, and, and I watch the funny videos and things like that. And I told him, uh, there's so much hatred and political posts on there. Why don't you try posting some verses? Why don't you share the, the, the Word of God in different places? We can use Facebook to praise the Lord. Uh, I've never had a post removed. I've had people say, well, I put, on, put this on, somebody took it off. Well, I've never had verses removed. Um, here's the neat thing. Isaiah 55, 11 says this, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall pos prosper in the thing which, uh, for which I sent it. Uh, even in sharing uh, verses in on Facebook or on uh, on different things, you know, we uh, his word goes out and ministers. You know, it doesn't come back. You know, I share verses and I share pictures and I say share things I think are funny, but but uh, putting verses this really convicted me. Putting verses and and praying over them, what power they will have in our community. Even that, you know, all the opportunities we have if we look for them. Um, Lastly, we're going to look at the last thing, which is the tribulation that, that, that uh, Paul was going through. And he encouraged him even on that. He said this, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. Uh, Paul's telling him, don't worry about my circumstances. Don't worry that I'm in prison and don't worry that I'm facing death. You don't worry about that. And he said, don't lose heart in that uh, and, and what's going on in my life. Everything was happening for them, he said, for their benefit. When, when Paul was in prison, he always wrote. He always wrote to, uh, the epistles and letters to the churches, and, and it gave him an opportunity to do that, to write. And, and even in that tribulation, it benefited them. It benefits us. Um, sometimes we go through uh, uh, things in our life, and they could be a benefit for other people. When I was in Houston uh, taking cancer treatments, it didn't take me long to realize that I was there for other people. And um, the ministry there was great, and the opportunities were great to, to pray for people and share God's Word and, and, and share our faith and, and, and everything that we did. And, and, and it was just that great opportunity there. And today we have the same opportunity in, in the tribulations that, we're search, uh, that we are going through now. We have an opportunity to share God's Word, and, and it has increased our opportunities to share God. With, with the people around us. People was, uh, people, uh, Paul was always putting his life on, in danger uh, to share the gospel. If you remember, there were a lot of towns that, that he was in, he would be preaching and they would take him out, take him out and stone him. And, and one time actually he was left for dead. And uh, you know what he would do when that happened? He would get up and he would go to another town and start all over again. Why would he do that? You know, why would he go through that? Because he knew the value. He knew, he knew the results. He knew the people that would be saved and churches that would be started, the lives that would be changed. And, and, and he knew, Paul knew how precious souls are. He knew that. He, he cared about other people. 
And, and we need to realize that when we see people around us and, and they're hurting and they're going through so much in this world, that we have an opportunity to, to share God's word with him. It, even through the things that we go through, use it as a, as a reach to other, uh, other people. Um, I'm going to share another story with you as I close. And, and it's, it's long and I'm sorry, but I'm going to share it anyway. But uh, uh, when I was in Rover, um, I had my truck stolen. It was just before I left Rover, uh, you know, couple of months but anyway it, it uh, we had had a long weekend there at, at Rover and I went over on a Friday night and was had to do some stuff in ministry and I stayed all the way through Monday uh, Monday afternoon because we had a, a food pantry and everything there and and anyway I met Kathy after she got off work and and we went home we went out to eat and then went home so we got home late and, and uh, anyway I just pulled up in the truck and and left it sitting there and and uh, unloaded what I, uh, what I had to have out of it and just uh, went in the house and we went, went ahead and went to bed. But, but anyway, the next morning I slept late and when I got up, I, uh, I made coffee and I walked down our long driveway down to get the paper and I was walking back up the house and I noticed that my wheelbarrow was sitting well out in the pasture and I, I looked out there and I go, well, what's my wheelbarrow doing out there? I said, I bet one of the boys came this weekend and got something or one of them did and, and they just you know how they are. They just left it laying out there. So uh, on my way to the house, I just went on out in the pasture and got my wheelbarrow and started back up the house. And I noticed I was following tracks and car tracks. And, and, and the tracks led right up to where my truck was sitting. And my truck wasn't there. It was gone. And I go, well, they must have used my truck for something, you know. So I, I called Kathy and I asked her if one of the boys had borrowed the truck, you know, while I was asleep. And if they had talked to her. And she said, she said, no, I didn't know anything about it. She says, but you know, when I left this morning, your truck was gone. And uh, so anyway, and as we were standing there talking, as I was, I was in the garage talking to her, I looked around and, and I had tools on the shelves and the tools were missing. And, and what had happened is they'd pushed my truck out away from the house and then they got my wheelbarrow and they'd come up there in the garage and they'd load up tools and push them down and load up the truck with the with tools we had and, uh, and carry it all away. And then I had to... Uh, uh, here I was, I was out of truck. I had to go through all the hassle of dealing with the uh, insurance company. And what I did was one of the other, one of the work trucks, I pulled a rack off of and the riding off of and, and uh, uh, began driving it. And, and that's what I drove when, even when I started to work here. I was still driving that, that work truck. And, and anyway, I'd been here about six months. And, and one Sunday night, Pastor Greg came to me with a couple. And uh, they had come to church and Bible study and uh, they were talking to him and they had needs and and I talked with them for, for a few minutes and I invited them to come back the next morning which was Monday morning and I said I'll hook you up with with some clothes and some food and some some supplies you know and and uh, anyway so they came the next morning and and I talked with them and, and they told me that they had just got out of they'd been in jail they'd been in prison and uh, they needed stuff you know they needed food and they needed household uh, supplies and, and some clothes and and uh, uh, anyway so uh, I helped them and they said they were trying to get their life back together and, and I, I fixed everything up and I, I found out that they lived just a few blocks from here and uh, that they were walking they were afoot because they didn't have a driver's license or anything and I told them I says if you'll wait a minute I'll go get my truck and I'll pull it around and I'll take y'all home so anyway I pulled the truck around and and here I was in a sole work truck. And anyway, and I apologized to him. I said, uh, I'm sorry you have tried this truck. I said, I had another truck and it was really nice, but, but I gave it away. And they said, you gave it away. And I said, we, yeah, but it was, it was in the middle of the night and I gave it to somebody I didn't know. And they said, was your truck stolen? And I said, yeah. And, and so anyway, we loaded all the stuff in the truck and I was taking them over there. And a the woman was asking me questions. What kind of truck was it? you know, and all this kind of stuff. And she was asking me about it. And if I know who stole it and all this kind of stuff. And I told her, I told her no. But anyway, uh, I took them to their apartment and let them out. And, and I prayed with them and then left. And um, uh, later that night, she called me. And she called me on my cell phone. And, and she said, I need to talk to you. And I thought, well, they're going through a tough time. And I said, I told her that was all right. And I asked her what was going on. And, and she told me, she said, I'm one of the people that stole your truck. <laughs> I said, you did, yeah. And she started telling me all about it. 
you know, how they did it and what they did and everything, what they got and, and, and everything. And, and I told her that was all right. And I said, listen, I, I completely, I forgive you. It's okay. You know, that's all right. And, and she said, but I feel really bad about it. And I can't sleep. And, and you helped us so much. And I, I just don't know what to say to you. And I asked her, I says, why don't you come back the, tomorrow morning and talk to me? So, and she did. And she come back and she told me how sorry she was and that, that she had done that. And, and that's a part of what she was in jail for. And, and uh, anyway, and I, I assured her that I completely forgave her. That was okay. You know, it didn't matter. And everything was all right. And I was glad I got to help her. And she, she told me this. She says, I don't know how you can forgive me. And I said, well, the reason is I've been forgiven. And I got to share the gospel with her. And right there in my office, I got to lead her to the Lord. And uh, uh, her her life became new. And she asked me later on if I hated her. And I told her no and uh, that I loved her. And I'd gladly give up another truck just, just to help somebody get into the kingdom of God, just to go to heaven. It was worth that truck to see her go to heaven because it was only a truck. And I'd like gladly give one of the others away for the same thing. What seems like a tragedy sometimes in our life um, turns out to be an ultimate blessing. That's what happened there. What was a tragedy for me turned out to be an ultimate blessing for her. But it was just a truck, you know. Uh, it didn't hurt me. Uh, in fact, it was a blessing for us. The insurance paid me for the truck and, and, and everything. And the funny thing is, I, um, the insurance paid, uh, it liked $500 covering what I gave for the truck five years earlier. But, but anyway, tragedies in our life can be a blessing for other people. You know, if we look, people watch to see what we're doing. People are watching our church when all this is going on and seeing what we do and what we say. And, and we have to be careful what we say and, and, and how we, we minister and, and, and not to, uh, to get in this uh, political and, and, and uh, thing that's going on and all the, um, the, the rights and, uh, and, and to watch what we say as far as that and, and use it for a ministry. Our uh, our answer to everything is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the, everything in our life, use every opportunity to reach those that, that are hurting in our world today and minister and show them the love of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for just being an awesome God. Uh, even in the little things in our life and, and even in the, the big things in our life, Lord, you're there and, and you use it, Lord, for your honor and glory and you bless us in, in, in different ways. And Lord, we just, we have to stand back in awe of you. It, it, uh, uh, you're our God and we love you and we praise you and, and we thank you for the, for the way that we've ministered already just all over the world. And, and Lord, the opportunities that are there now, Lord, we just, we just pray that you use us any way you can to minister to this, this lost and dying world that's around us. Just help us to be the love and the light that shines among, among everything that's going on. We pray that you just guide us and keep us safe and watch over us. And, and we pray that everything in our lives is a blessing for you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, uh, I want everybody to stay safe. And, and, uh, and again, I'll say the same thing I said last week. If you need anything, call. Uh, you can call me or you can call Sherry Rowe or call the church and we'll, uh, we'll help you any way we can. Uh, but uh, minister to those around you in any way that you can through this, through this time that we're going through. Everybody's trying to decide uh, what to do and and where to go, if we're going to have school or we're not going to have school, or we're going to have classes, we're not going to have classes. Everybody's worried about everything, but God's in control. Just, just give it to him. Uh, remember that Kathy and I love you, and we care for you so much. And, and uh, we were talking last night how much we just long to see everyone and fellowship and, and, and be with, with y'all again. But, but uh, y'all be careful, and y'all be safe, and we're praying for you. Okay? Good night.